Good morning and good evening. I think almost everyone is ready, and the time is about 9 a.m. in Taipei, 9 p.m. in East Coast United States. So let's now begin today's meeting entitled U.S. Taiwan Precision Medicine Forum, which is the first webinar for BioAsia in Taiwan conference. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for joining us uh, from Taipei and from the United States. My name is Emily Ho from Taiwan Investment and Trade Office based in New York City. I have the pleasure of being your MC today to facilitate uh, the flow of meeting. During the meeting, if you have any questions and suggestions, please feel free to type them down through YouTube chat box. My colleagues in Taipei will collect all the questions you have and provide to the speakers to answer in the final panel discussion session. Uh, today, we are very honored uh, to bring together a great group, group of distinguished experts from industry and also from academia to discuss uh, the cutting edge technologies and solutions in precision medicine. According to a new research report by Global Market Insights published just this month in June, precision medicine market size is set to surpass 112 billion US dollars by 2027. This huge market potential and beneficiary to human health that brought by precision medicine have attracted numerous scientific researchers and pharmaceutical companies to invest in resources. No wonder today, you know what? We have nearly 140 participants sign up for uh, this event, hoping to understand the latest development in this field. Without further ado, let's begin to take today's program by inviting first four industrial and governmental leaders from Taiwan and from the United States to deliver opening remarks. I would like to welcome our event organizer, Dr. Zhong Xun Wu. He is the president of Taiwan's Development Center for Biotechnology and also concurrently the director of Biopharma Industries Promotion Office under the Ministry of Economic Affairs. Greetings to you all. It is a great honor to co-organize the U.S. Taiwan Precision Medicine Forum with the Investment and the Trade Office of the Taipei Economic and the Cultural Office in New York. Precision medicine defines a revolution in modern medicine. Genetic testing and analysis for individual disease allow medical treatment to be more precise and effective and can further advance our knowledge of preventive health care. Over the past decade or so, the scientific basis and the clinical benefits of precision medicine has been validated in many aspects. In particular, for cancer and hereditary diseases, we are enabled to identify novel prevention and treatment methods against disease targeting and specific patient populations. Precision medicine has become an invaluable and in many cases, a necessary tool to guide medical diagnosis and treatment. It is also constitute a key component in Taiwan's healthcare development strategy and is expected to lead a new round of industrial change as well. I would like to thank all the experts from Taiwan and the United States who made time to attend this forum during BioAsia Taiwan 2021 and for their insightful lectures in support of the event. I also would like to thank all the attendees who participated online. Today's event not only showcases some of the achievements from Taiwan and U.S. biotech industry, it also directed to a vision that forging through the uneasy efforts from the public and the private sectors. Biotech industry will position itself as one of the primary driving force for the future economic growth in Taiwan. Lastly, my best wishes for the success of this event and hope all the attendees will enjoy a fruitful and fulfilling forum. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Wu. Secondly, let's welcome our event co-organizer, Director David Ding from Taiwan Investment and Trade Office based in New York. Let's welcome Director Ding. Hi. All the distinguished speakers and biotech-related experts, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good evening. Hello. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm David Ding from Taiwan Investment and Trade Office, based in New York City. My office represents the Ministry of Economic Affairs of Taiwan. Our mission is to enhance business and the technology partnership with the United States. My office is delighted to have this opportunity to co-host today's event, U.S. Taiwan Precision Medicine Forum, with Taiwan's Biotech and Pharma Industrial Promotion Office. Thank you all for taking the time to join us today. The pandemic, though, is a very, very painful crisis. It accelerated global collaboration on medical supply chain, from cutting-edge technology research to drug product manufacturing, more extensively and closely. Last November, high-level government officers from Taiwan and the United States met for the U.S.-Taiwan Economy Prosperity Partnership Dialogue, and then both signed an MOU to further strengthen collaboration on global health. This June, the United, United States and Taiwan held the 11th TIFA Council meeting. We discussed a broader range of issues, including the importance of secure supply chain, the medical device approval process, and etc. With the aim to strengthen bilateral biotech collaboration today, my office invites outstanding experts from New Jersey and Pennsylvania to share their innovative gene therapy against rare disease and Alzheimer's. I hope today's meeting can inspire more bilateral collaboration to improve human health protection and prevention. Taiwan support the Biden administration that calls for closer cooperation with allies and partners to ensure global resilience at post-COVID era. Again, thank you all for joining us. I wish today's event a great success and a fruitful results. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Director our third speaker is Ms. Debbie Hart, founding president and CEO of Bio New Jersey. She established the Bio New Jersey in 1994 and has been dedicated to the biotech industry since then with more than 20 years experiences. Let's welcome Debbie. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much, Emily. I am just delighted and honored to be here with you today. And thank you again to Emily and also to Dr. Sung Shun Wu, CEO of Taiwan's Development Center for Biotechnology, as well as Director David Ding from Taiwan Investment and Trade Office in New York. My ONJ had the privilege of signing a memorandum of understanding with the Taiwan Bio Industry Organization in 2015. And it is our hope that alliances such as the one between Taiwan Bio and Bio NJ will foster new business opportunities, research collaborations, and ultimately life-saving medical innovation. Many companies throughout Taiwan and the U.S., and certainly in New Jersey, have engaged in long and well-established strategic partnerships. Next slide, please. As the Life Sciences Trade Association for New Jersey, BioNJ's mission is to make sure that innovation in New Jersey is enabled and to ensure that patients have access to the therapies and cures that they need when they need them. And not only does New Jersey's life sciences community make up a large part of the Garden State's economy, our companies and research institutions are changing the lives of millions of patients around the world. Next slide, please. As the medicine chess of the world, New Jersey has a rich history of medical innovation, including being the birthplace of immunotherapy by one of BioNJ's founding members, Metarex, which was later acquired by Bristol Myers Squibb, the first ever FDA approval for a CAR T cell therapy by Novartis, the cure for hepatitis C was developed by New Jersey's own company, Pharmacet. And in 2015, the first FDA approval for a 3D printed drug by Apresia, just to name a few diverse examples. Next slide, please. 
home to nearly 3,300 life sciences establishments, including eight of the top 10 R&D companies and 13 of the top 20 global biopharma companies, the Garden State has seen an influx of biopharma companies setting up headquarters and facilities in our state. The concentration of New Jersey's research hospitals, medical schools, and universities, combined with the state's population density, multicultural diversity, and transportation infrastructure make New Jersey a perfect location for clinical trials. Leading the way in medical innovation, more than 40% of all FDA drug approvals in 2020 came from companies with a footprint in New Jersey. Also, New Jersey is number one in the nation with 139 FDA registered biopharma manufacturing facilities. And as we know, cell and gene therapy is growing globally and New Jersey has quickly become a leader from discovery through manufacturing. In fact, 30% of all cell and gene therapies in development are being done right here in our region. Shortly, we'll hear from BioNJ member Amicus Therapeutics founded in New Jersey on the groundbreaking work that they are doing in the area of cell and gene therapy and rare disease. It's all really very exciting. Next slide, please. With the onset of COVID-19, I really have never been more proud to represent this industry. Our industry is literally saving the world and BioNJ members have had a very significant hand in that. So there are more than 500 companies working globally on more than 800 programs to ad address COVID-19, whether it be therapies, vaccines, or diagnostics. More than 70 New Jersey companies are working on one or more of those programs. We are, of course, very proud of that. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, that's sort of a, a picture of the New Jersey life sciences ecosystem and we look forward to continuing to build our relationship with the Taiwan Bio Industry Organization and all of you who might be interested in partnering with us here at Bio and J. And it's my hope to continue to bring our members together. Such tremendous opportunities are on the horizon. So Emily, to you and to all of your colleagues, if we can be of assistance in any way at Bio and J, please do reach out. We're happy to connect you with our robust life sciences ecosystem and tell you about the many benefits of opening a facility in the Garden State. So thank you again for including me in today's program. I hope everyone stays safe and well. Emily, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Last but not least, I would like to introduce Mr. Kurt Inhofe from Life Sciences Pennsylvania. Every four years, Bio International returns to Philadelphia and Life Science PA is the largest contributor behind the scenes. I recall in 2019, Taiwan led a huge delegation with more than 200 people to join the Philly Convention and for hopefully to see we have a larger gathering event in the near future in Philadelphia. Kurt, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emily. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, thank you very much to the uh, Taiwan Trade and Investment Office and the Taiwan Ministry of Economic Affairs uh, for hosting this morning's briefing. Uh, uh, as Debbie Hart noted from Bio New Jersey, uh, Life Sciences Pennsylvania was pleased to be a part of the Memoranda of Understanding that was signed in 2015. Uh, we work closely with our state partners uh, and international partners on ensuring that um, there is a, a business and public policy climate uh, that fosters growth in the life sciences industry. Uh, life Sciences Pennsylvania is the statewide trade association for the Commonwealth's life sciences community. We have 840 member organizations that are comprised of large pharmaceutical manufacturers, small biotech companies, device, medical device and diagnostics makers, academic research institutions, patient advocacy organizations, and all of these support services that prop up the industry, uh, including law firms, uh, accounting firms, uh, clinical research organizations, contract manufacturers, and many others. We are also the state level partner for five national life sciences trade associations. 
because Emily mentioned the uh, the biotechnology organization and their conference, uh, we I will note that we are a proud partner of, of Bio, uh, as well as several other national trade associations based in Washington, D.C. The life sciences in Pennsylvania is significant. There are approximately 2,800 life sciences establish, uh, establishments in the Commonwealth. Uh, it's important to know, however, that about 52% of those are organizations with fewer than 10 employees. So it's a very startup driven community. As you can see from the map, uh, most of uh, the life sciences companies in Pennsylvania reside either in South Pen Eastern Pennsylvania around Philadelphia or in Southwestern Pennsylvania around Pittsburgh. Life sciences in Pennsylvania also make up, or I should say, are an important economic contributor to the Commonwealth. There are about uh, 112,000 people directly employed by the life sciences industry, and there is over $2 billion that comes to the state uh, via National Institutes of Health funding. Uh, this, uh, this places Pennsylvania in the top five of NIH grant recipients in the country, and we have two of the top 10 NIH uh, grant recipient universities in the country, the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Pittsburgh. As you can see, we also have, have significant uh, bioscience investment in the Commonwealth as well. That brings me to one important piece of today's, uh, today's discussion, and that is the rise of Philadelphia uh, and Pennsylvania as a hub for cell and gene therapy growth. Uh, Pennsylvania has seen significant increases in cell and gene therapy funding. A lot of this is based on the very exciting research happening at our academic research institutions, coupled with the long legacy of pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, in, in Pennsylvania and in southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, in particular, you have a strong environment uh, for startup growth and for exciting new ventures in this precision medicine arena. One piece I want to highlight is that in Philadelphia, in the first quarter of this year, we saw uh, over close to $3 billion in investment, private investment in life sciences uh, in, uh, in southeastern Pennsylvania. Close to $1 billion, $980 million of that went specifically to cell and gene therapy companies. You'll be hearing, I know, from Amicus Therapeutics, a member of Life Sciences Pennsylvania, uh, as well as the University of Pennsylvania in uh, this morning's discussion. And we are pleased to call uh, those two entities members uh, of our organization. We look forward to furthering this partnership uh, and building upon the MOU that was signed in 2015. Thank you for the opportunity to present this morning. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt, for taking the time to join us. And I think from the fourth uh, opening remarks, uh, our audience can understand general uh, policies and ecosystem in U.S. and in Taiwan. Our second speaker, I would like to introduce Dr. Li Sang Wang, a professor from University of Pennsylvania, who also leads Pan Neurodegeneration Genomic Center uh, abbreviation as PNGC in UK. He spent lots of efforts in studying genetics of Alzheimer's disease and other related dementia in order to translate these findings into biological knowledge about the disease and also to search for new directions for drug discovery and preventive strategies. Please welcome Dr. Wang. I'm Lee San Wang, I'm from University of Pennsylvania, and I work on genetic Alzheimer's disease. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving this opportunity to uh, share with you uh, some of our recent work. And uh, here's my slide. Uh, I'll talk about uh, some of our latest findings and uh, uh, research programs on genetic Alzheimer's disease. First, some background. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia in seniors. It comes with uh, extensive brain atrophy in a gradual and progressive uh, fashion, which leads to change of personality, loss of cognitive abilities, and eventually incapacitation and death. And Alzheimer's is a big health issue. It is the sixth 
topmost cause of death in the United States. And at this moment, uh, they're estimating about 50 million people affected with Alzheimer's around the world. And at this moment, there's no effective cure or prevention or means to slow down the disease progression in a meaningful way. The uh, gold standard for uh, diagnosing Alzheimer's is still post-mortem autopsy when you uh, uh, we put the uh, patient's brain under the microscope and we're looking for two hallmarks of Alzheimer's, which are protein aggregates in the brain. One is CNAP plaques, which are many uh, made up of uh, beta, am beta amyloids or sometimes we call it A-beta. And the other type of aggregate is neurofibrillary tangles, which are formed by the uh, tau protein. There's additional evidence pointing out the importance of beta amyloids in the role of Alzheimer's and neurodegeneration. In early onset Alzheimer's cases, which comprise about 1% of all the Alzheimer's cases, we see mutations in the APB gene, which uh, forms the uh, precursor of beta amyloids, as you see all the protein on the left. And also we see mutations in these two genes, presenilins one and two, which are part of the gamma secretase, which are important for this uh, processing of ABP into A-beta. In late onset Alzheimer's, uh, the, it has a high heritability, which suggests a strong genetic component. And the biggest, the most uh, famous well-known genetic risk factor is the APOE gene, where we know is associated with the clearance of beta amyloids in the brain. So these are all the evidence saying amyloids is an important part of Alzheimer's uh, ideology. However, clinical trials are targeting amyloids keeps failing and uh, there are many, many stories. The latest one, which uh, actually got FDA accelerated approval, the uh, Adelhelm by Biogen, but there's still a lot of controversy about this and uh, they need to do a confirmation study to show it has clinical effects. So what does that tell us? Maybe the clinical uh, studies are uh, targeting people who are, it's too late to be reversed. So that means we hope to target uh, patients at even earlier stage of neurodegeneration, or we should do a prevention trial. And maybe there are other targets than uh, beta amyloids that we should try out. So what that means is we need early diagnosis, sensitive diagnosis. We need to identify people with high risk for clinical trials. And also we need new ideas and targets for drug discovery. Uh, our approach to understanding Alzheimer's is genetics, human genetics in particular. We do genome-wide association studies. Conceptually, uh, this works by recruiting many Alzheimer's patients and uh, uh, non-patients who are like cutting normal uh, controls. We collect their DNA and then we genotype the genetic variations, which are different uh, between people in the population, and then we compare them. We want to see if there are particular variants that are significantly different between patients and controls, and that suggests there are nearby genes that are probably important for uh, the biology of Alzheimer's, and then we continue to study that. It's a very powerful approach, but it also needs a lot of participants. Uh, the biggest program for Alzheimer's genetics in the United States is Alzheimer's Disease Genetics Consortium. It works with Alzheimer's disease researchers across the nation. They're funded, established by National Institute of Aging. They have been recruiting participants and they have been depositing DNA and phenotypes into uh, their, their respective coordinating centers. That means ADGC can uh, identify subjects that are appropriate for uh, genotyping uh, for GWAS study quickly. We also collab with other epidemiological studies that look at Alzheimer's. In total, we have more than 30,000 participants uh, that have Alzheimer's disease or uh, cognitive normal controls. And that gives us a lot of statistical power. We also collaborate with uh, other countries uh, the uh, International Genomics Alzheimer's Project is uh, one such big project. Uh, we published our latest findings in Nature Genetics 2019. And uh, as you can see, there are many, many findings. The taller you see here, uh, the more statistical significant the, uh, uh, the genomic region is uh, associated with Alzheimer's disease. What are the major findings in this uh, paper? First, we found new associations that are genome-wide significant, which means they are statistically uh, significant uh, beyond uh, just by chance. 
And the second is once we take all these loci together to find out what pathways or what biological mechanisms these genes are involved, some pathways have emerged, such as immunity, lipid metabolism, the tau binding. Remember, tau protein is associated, uh, uh, it, it is the component of the uh, neurofibrillary tangles, the molecular hallmark of Alzheimer's, and metabolism of the APB gene. And uh, the other thing is these pathways are enriched for rare variants, variants that are really rare in the population, usually less than 1%. So you need even more samples to uh, further uh, characterize that. So what have we learned from these GWAS studies? Uh, we've been doing this for uh, probably 15 years. Uh, it's until 2009 that you have uh, like gene wise new findings. And there are more than 100 different kinds of studies, uh, almost 1,000 unique loci genomic regions when you start analyzing association with uh, other phenotypes or other populations. We I I'd like to invite you to this website we compiled called AD Variant Portal to uh, find out these records. Uh, and here's what we find. The first is most of the common variants, allele frequencies, they appear in more than 1% of the population. Their impact is really modest, except for APOE. The other variants usually just increase the risk by 1% or less. The second is uh, when you lump all these common variants, they don't explain the whole heritability. They explain a portion, a minor, a minor portion of the heritability that we uh, estimate from Alzheimer's. So there are some genetic components there that we haven't seen. So where is the hidden heritability? That's the first question. And the second is, well, we got to come up with new approaches to find where these things are, maybe using new technologies, maybe using better uh, sequencing uh, approaches to uh, study these rare variants. So that's what we're going to do. And the last thing is sample size is really, really important. Without enough samples, you wouldn't have statistical powers to make additional discoveries. So what are the next steps we're going to do for Alzheimer's research? And these are just four of the possible directions we're exploring. We want to start analyzing the complete sequences of the genomes of Alzheimer's patients. We want to study other populations. We want to uh, aggregate all these data, put them together using uh, the latest data science advances to find new patterns and generate new hypotheses. And we want to integrate these genetic findings with uh, functional experimental data uh, to tell you what genes are affected, what are the tissue contexts, and uh, what are the pathways. So I'll talk about these uh, briefly. The first is sequencing. Uh, the biggest program is called Alzheimer's Disease Sequencing Project, or ADSP. Uh, it is a strategic initiative uh, of NIH and National Institute of Aging. The goal is to uh, sequence uh, Alzheimer's patients, and controls generate their complete genome sequences and analyze these data to find new genetic variants, especially rare variants. At this moment, we have released close to 17 complete genomes and 20,000 exomes. And uh, we're working our next release, which will be available end of this year, or beginning of next year, which will double the number sample size and even more sequence, uh, sequence to be generated uh, the following year as well. So this is a truly valuable resource and very exciting opportunity. Some of the preliminary findings, uh, we analyzed the first phase of the uh, whole exome sequencing of uh, close to 11,000 samples. Exomes are the uh, exonic regions uh, of each of a gene that calls the sequence of the protein. So when there are changes to that, it changes the uh, function or the structure of the protein directly, and there are very good methods to predict their impact. So, uh, uh, and also it's a much smaller region where we can uh, have more focused statistical power. And we're analyzing these data. We found some new significance in genes that uh, they are rare variants, but they have stronger effects and they are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So by looking at additional uh, genomic sequences, uh, we expect there will be uh, other findings in particular of non-coding regions that are not outside this one person of exons. The second is diversity. We want to study uh, other populations. Most of the uh, studies we just mentioned are mainly focused on uh, Caucasians of European ancestry, 
And uh, people start to realize that introduced some serious bias and it's not the best way to do uh, ge human genetic research. And there are a series of papers talking about uh, how this is affecting the science. Uh, the first is uh, you only see genetic variants that are specific to uh, um, European ancestry and you're missing these variants that are specific to other populations. And the second is the uh, genetic findings don't are not necessarily applicable if the population is not matched. And that means that's introducing even more disparity in uh, healthcare. So we need to address these issues. I want to talk about one population, Asian Americans. Asians are the fastest growing minority in the United States and Canada, but uh, it's also it's seriously underrepresented Alzheimer's research. In ADSP, as an example, uh, this is an older number. In the new numbers, we're starting to have some samples from uh, Asian countries, but again, we don't have samples in U.S. Americans, and uh, uh, that's something that we need to address. Uh, we have formed a consortium called ACAT, Asian Cons Cohort for Alzheimer's Disease. Because Asian Americans are a minority population, smaller, uh, we need to recruit from multiple sites in the national scale. So we have enough statistical power to make meaningful genetic discoveries. So we've been working with uh, eight different sites and uh, many institutions to set up this study. And most of these uh, participants are probably immigrants, which means they will have problems speaking English. So we need to develop culturally appropriate and translated uh, materials that will allow us to uh, uh, better recruiting and sales the participants. We just started uh, uh, recruiting and uh, consenting participants and we hope to make uh, really quick progress in the next few months. And uh, we hope their opportunity to work with uh, uh, studies in Asia as well. Now, the third direction we want to explore is once we have these genetic findings, how do they translate to biology? In some sense that uh, some, the, the actual genes that are functional, are causal, could be very far away from the genetic finding. Here's one famous example uh, talking about uh, obesity or body mass index, BMI. And FTO locus is very well known. It has a very strong effects, but there's some evidence suggesting that the genetic association actually is not about the FTO gene, but it's regulating this gene that's almost a like almost have 500,000 basis pairs away. So it's pretty far. And uh, this points to an additional hypothesis. When you have a genetic finding, you should look at all the nearby genes and see which one probably fits the biology better. And you should support that with uh, functional data that measures the activities of genes in different uh, uh, tissues and cell types. Because when DNA is the same across all the different cell types, the genes certainly act differently. So, uh, for example, we developed this tool called Inferno, which stands for inferring the molecular me mechanisms of non coding genetic variants that allows us to integrate different kinds of functional data and generate hypotheses for our biologists to explore. When we apply it to Alzheimer's GWAS, this is an older study, and we do see some enrichment in particular tissue types. In this case, especially with blood, where that reflects the importance of immunity in Alzheimer's disease. And statistical analysis shows indeed is a statistical significance. It's not just by chance. And uh, researchers are uh, then can focus on these uh, particular loci and pick the right cellular types to do follow-up experiments. And when we take other borderline uh, genetic evidence together and do statistical analysis, that's where the pathways start to emerge. This is the result from the Nature Genetics 2019 study. And as you can see that uh, these genetic findings, when you look at it genome-wide, you have important pathways emerging, in particular the uh, uh, activation of immune response, which is one of the hottest areas in Alzheimer's research at this moment. Uh, with these, uh, ADSB has introduced new programs to go beyond just finding genetic associations. We want to aggregate, we want to collect and harmonize other kinds of phenotypes than just case control status. For example, cognitive test results, neuropsychiatric symptoms, brain imaging data, and medical history and risk. Uh, and and uh, as you can imagine, because the data come from different cohorts, there are 
there's challenge to harmonize to make these data comparable. And we have a work group as well as a consortium working with uh, uh, dozens of investigators who are experts in these different categories to uh, bring these data together so they can be analyzed uh, consistently. NIH has funded uh, several grants to uh, generate additional functional genomic data that includes gene expression, epigenomics, proteomics, and metabolomics, and single cell data. So with these data, it allows us to characterize the uh, biological roles and uh, impacts of the genetic findings that we have. Finally, all these data should be put together and we use the latest data science approaches such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and uh, uh, we, these data should be together uh, in, a, in the same environment, cloud environment for these computations. So that's what uh, our group is uh, working on now. We're, we're proposing a cloud platform called ADAPT that's focusing on Alzheimer's genetics and genomics research. And it's going to be a multi-year uh, project involving different kinds of components where we can integrate different uh, resources and data together using uh, robust cloud platforms and technology. It's an ongoing process, but it's, uh, uh, it's really important. Our data is big and complex. The entire genomic data is more than two petabytes in size. And cloud is the only way that we can make the data available to the research community. Uh, all these are uh, coordinated by NIGATS, which stands for NIA Genetics of Alzheimer's Disease Data Store Insight. Uh, this is a qualified uh, data repository run by University of Pennsylvania by our lab. And we do different kinds of roles for our ADSP. We serve as the data coordinate center and we share data with the uh, investigators uh, with a qualified access process. So the data sharing and data use is compliant with the informed consent. And uh, we have a website that uh, uh, outlines all the details about the study, as well as the, some of the new programs. And here is the web link. I invite you to uh, uh, have a look, learn about our programs, and uh, let us know if you have any questions or if you are opportunities to collaborate. So to summarize, um, for Alzheimer's genetics, international collaborations to assemble large samples is absolutely important. So we have enough sample size. We need to go beyond the initial GWAS studies. That means whole genome sequencing to look at rare variants, looking at diversity uh, cohorts, other non-white, uh, non-European non cohorts. We need to have new functional data, new computational approaches to translate these genetic associations to uh, genes and pathways and tissue types. We need to take a big data approach as the data gets bigger and more complex. Integrating with functional data and environmental expo exposure data and use advanced data science methods to uh, find new patterns and hypotheses using machine learning and AI approaches. And finally, we look for collaborations. We need more researchers to make sense of these uh, valuable resources and uh, find new targets for drug discovery. Uh, there are many people that I have to uh, thank. This is, uh, you know, it wouldn't be possible with uh, the hundreds of investigators and staff from uh, dozens of institutions. And of course, special thanks to our funding institution. Uh, and uh, thank you again for your time. Uh, we're looking for collaborations with talents. Uh, uh, NIGA is a project I just mentioned, and uh, we have a research center, Penn New Engineering Genomics Center. And uh, here's my email. And I look forward to uh, hear your uh, advice and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Uh, our third speaker is Ms. Christy Sano, Senior Director for Business Development and Corporate Strategy from Homology Medicines based in Massachusetts. Their mission is to advance gene editing and gene therapy platform and to transform the lives of patients by potentially curing rare genetic diseases. Uh, let's welcome Ms. Sano. Hi, this is Christy Sarno. I'm the Senior Director of Business Development here at Homology Medicines, and I'm excited to present to you today what we're working on here at Homology. Before I begin, Homology Medicines is a publicly traded company, and therefore I would like to advise 
that certain remarks I will make may constitute forward-looking statements. To see a full list of risk factors that may impact the company, please refer to the risk factors section of our most recent quarterly report on Form 10-Q filed with the SEC. So Homology Medicine is a gene therapy company and our mission is to cure genetic disease. This is the mission that all of the employees are working on every day at Homology. And there's a number of ways that we're doing this. We have several tenants that make up a differentiated company in the gene therapy space. So one of them is our technology platform. This is the basis for all of our programs. So this technology is comprised of 15 novel AAV HSCs, HSC for human stem cells. So these are human derived novel AAVs that we have access to and as part of our IP portfolio. And these different AAVs have different tropisms to different tissue types. So we have access right through this platform to choosing the right capsid for the right program and the right indication. And this is an extensive IP portfolio that we've been leveraging since the company was formed. The company was formed with a management team with a lot of rare disease experience in the industry. So many of them are from Shire, Genzyme, Sarapta, all of the um, companies that have been focused on rare disease in the past and came together to form homology and bring that experience to bear. Um, in the past five years of our existence, we have put through four development candidates and we have a new development candidate planned to be announced this year, which I will speak about further. And right now we are really focused on clinical trial execution. We have our lead candidate for PKU, gene therapy candidate, which I will speak about more, enrolling right now. And we plan to initiate two more clinical trials before the end of the year. And in addition, we have, we have in-house manufacturing expertise. We chose to develop this asset as soon as the company was formed and it has paid off in spades, especially given the COVID pandemic. We haven't had any delays producing our own clinical trial material. And we have really expanded our efforts in this space given the importance of manufacturing to a quality product. So just to expand a little bit more on manufacturing, all of our manufacturing is in-house. Um, it's a triple transfection suspension process that we have scaled to 2000 liters, which is the highest in the industry right now. Um, and we use, uh, again, we use our internal manufacturing to provide all of our own clinical trial material. And we have run numerous different lots with different constructs. And all of this leads to a commercial process ready to go, um, scalable from research up to commercial and with um, 15, three 500 liter scales as well as our 2000 liter. We also do all of our own process development and vector characterization in-house with a strong set of analytics supporting all of these activities. So we really have three different ways that we approach um, gene therapy and gene editing right now. Um, so traditional gene therapy is what we use for our lead program in PKU, which is episomal. We also have gene editing. Now gene editing is a little bit different for us than the typical CRISPR type of editing that you may be familiar with. So with CRISPR, there's a cut in the DNA and then amino acids fill in to provide the, provide the rest of the sequence. With homologous recombination, which is the type of editing that we use, there's a there's a corrective template that's provided to, and then that template is guided by homology, homology arms, and then that template is then copied. This results in a very high fidelity process with few errors, and I'll um, show some data on that in, in further on in the presentation. Additionally, we announced earlier this year that we have included as well a vectorized antibody program, which we call GTX MAB. So this is almost a platform and within a platform where we can use our gene therapy vectors to produce full length IgG antibodies within the body. We think this is an exciting new way of leveraging these gene therapy tools. As I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, we do have 15 different vectors available to us and we have characterized 11 of them extensively in non-human primates. Here is some of the data that you can see in some of our publications where we have actually mapped out 
where the different capsids go into the different tissues. Sometimes there's um, a need for more vector in one type of tissue than another. Sometimes you're just targeting one particular tissue. So we have these options already at our fingertips with this platform that we have based our company on. So here's our current pipeline divided into those three categories. So in the traditional gene therapy space, again, we have our adult PKU program, and that's gene therapy, and that is currently in the clinic right now. We have our MPS2, or Hunter syndrome pr program, which we expect to initiate in clinical trials before the end of this year. And we also have a program for metachromatic leukodystrophy, or MLD, which is in the preclinical space at the moment. I mentioned our GTX MAB platform. Our candidate for that is going to be targeting PNH, and we hope to name that candidate before the end of this year. And in gene editing, we have a follow-on program in PKU, and that's going to be targeted towards the pediatric population. And that we also hope to we also hope to be in the clinic before the end of this year. We also have other work ongoing in the preclinical space with our gene editing technology. So to dive in a little bit on PKU, if you're not familiar with this disease, this is an inborn error of metabolism caused by mutations in the PAH gene. And so what happens here is basically an accumulation of phi in the blood, which has detrimental effects. Um, and many of these effects are neurological. Um, as you can see in the pathway on the right, um, that some of the metabolites from this pathway lead to neurotransmitters. And if, if the pathway is interrupted, there can be serious um, issues with this. So the standard of care right now is basically a diet um, where essentially these patients can't eat protein. So as you can imagine, that's a very hard diet to comply with. And it, it starts out in kids or tend to comply a little bit more with their parents to help them. And as patients age and, and progress with the disease, they become less compliant and then more complications arise. There are some therapeutics on the market that, that help with controlling these fee levels, um, but they're not available to all patients and they don't restore this, this, this normal biochemical pathway. So physicians and patients are still in a, in a high level of unmet need and new treatment options are, are definitely needed. And so our HMI 102 program is a one-time intravenous gene therapy um, designed to restore fee levels to normal and has the potential to replace the standard of care. We're pretty excited about this program. Uh, we had very good data in our phase one study um, with no um, SAEs, and we had two patients out of six that achieved um, our target B levels. The one good thing about PKU is that there is this biomarker basically measuring B in the bloodstream, so it's, um, it's an easy biomarker to measure and, and see how we're doing with our gene therapy treatment. So all of the learnings from our dose escalation phase one study are now being applied to our dose expansion phase. And, and again, enrollment is ongoing in this study at the moment. This is the design of the current study. We've designed this study to be able to have the potential to convert to a registrational trial. So as you can see on the left, we, we have two different doses plus a concurrent control. So for every five patients, there'll be two with each of the two doses and one control. And the target population are adults with classical PKU. And again, this is a single IV administration and the primary endpoint is that change in baseline from mean plasma fee. And we'll also be looking at some secondary endpoints such as whether or not the patients can liberalize from that restrictive diet and some neurocognitive evaluation as well. Moving on to HMI 103, which is our editing candidate for PKU. So this again will be different from HMI 102 in that the repair will actually be integrated into the genome. And this is again using our homologous recombination, which is the body's natural repair mechanism. And we'll be um, studying this in adults first, and then we'll move on to pediatric patients and um, assess how the rapidly growing liver in these patients can integrate the gene. And so we're, again, anticipating trial initiation this year, and we're getting ready to, to go with that. 
we had some encouraging preclinical data with HMI-103. As you can see on the left here, um, this is a murine surrogate model where we had a human-specific gene editing vector integrated into the PAH locus. And you can see how the serum fee levels are greatly reduced on the left, which is what we were looking for. And what we're doing with gene editing here is taking a look at, with some, some newly developed sequencing methods here at Homology, just to cover if there are de novo mutations introduced in other areas of the genome or if there are inverted terminal repeats. And so far, we haven't seen any of those side effects, if you will, of gene editing. Um, and that's based on this high fidelity homologous recombination process that we use. A little bit more here on our Hunter syndrome program. So this is HMI 203. And so many of you are probably aware that Hunter syndrome is um, a disease that does have neurocognitive effects. The standard of care for this disease has been an enzyme replacement therapy called Eloprase. And many patients have been on this, this treatment for a number of years now. But what can be seen is that these, this enzyme replacement therapy does not um, cover the CNS um, side effects that these patients see. So as the patients get older and, and have been on this treatment for, some of them are in their third or fourth decade, they are having some other peripheral side effects such as sleep apnea, loss of hearing, um, other forms of anxiety, and other peripheral side effects. And so while there are a lot of companies looking at ways to um, correct the CNF side effects, what we are planning to do with our clinical trial is address these adult patients with peripheral symptoms first. Um, and that's the population that we will be targeting in our first clinical trial. And we feel like this is a differentiated way of um, looking at this disease. And this is based on the experience of a lot of our management team with this disease and these patients in that um, not a lot of attention is paid to, uh, to these adult patients that are still suffering from these side effects. And so we're going to address that first and then continue to look at other populations such as pediatric as we move forward. Um, one thing about our capsid technology is that we have been able to show that, that it, we are able to cross into the blood-brain barrier and the blood-nerve barrier with one IV injection. So we do expect to see some significant effects in the CNS as we progress with this program. And so again, so we're, we're targeting both the peripheral and the CNS from this single IV infusion. And our IND enabling studies for this program have demonstrated this in an MPS2 mouse model. Um, and so again, we'll plan, we plan to enroll in this study before the end of this year. And starting with evaluation of those peripheral manifestations that I measured. And then of course, we'll include other endpoints such as ITS, I2S levels and the gag reduction in serum, urine, and CSF. This is some of the preclinical data from our HMI203 program. So a typical biomarker for MPS2 is these gag heparin sulfate levels. You can see on the top left, measuring this, these levels in various different tissue types, we see a significant reduction after our one IV injection. And on the bottom left, you see pooled um, CSF from a mouse, from mice, um, showing again reduction in that gag levels in the CSF. On the right-hand side, you can see some phenotypic correction, um, again, looking at paw width and arch width, which are typical manifestations in the mouse model of this disease. And you can see the, the changes there following the injection with our gene therapy vector. So we've reached the relevant tissues for MPS2 and we've showed a biochemical and a phenotypic correction in our mouse models. Um, and then, and we've also seen this long-term transduction and expression in the different tissues as was shown on the previous slide. Sustained sec secretion of I2S into the serum, which was not shown and uh, reduced gag levels in the all tissues tested, plus the phenotypic correction. So these data have led us to progress with our plans to initiate our phase one, two study for this program by the end of this year. 
And I mentioned at the beginning of the talk about our new platform within a platform, as we like to call it, which is our new vectorized antibody platform. And our first target for this will be a disease called PNH, which is um, the target here is C5, which has an effect on the complement pathway um, and leads to um, intravascular hemolysis, these, these PEGA mutations. Um, and this is mediated by uncontrolled activation of this complement system. So currently for NPNH, um, patients are chronically dosed with an anti-C5 antibody. And this uh, leads to some undesired effects, such as a, um, a bolus injection is say at the beginning of the week and by the end of the week, the patients are suffering fatigue and other signs of, of needing another injection before they get to their next one. So it's really a good target for um, a technology such as this, where the antibody would then be delivered at a more constant level, which is one of the reasons why we chose this indication for our first foray into vectorized antibodies. So we, we do have data which was presented at ASGCT this year that we are able to express a full length antibody against C5 and that that antibody is indeed functional and that the antibody is sustained over a period of time, at least up to 20 weeks. Um, and so we are very excited to continue to release data on this program as we, as we move along and then announce that we have a development candidate in this indication before the end of this year. And so again, very busy year for homology this year with potentially three programs in the clinic and another development candidate on the way as well as maintaining and increasing our IP on the manufacturing side and um, really continuing to advance and make sure that we're best in class on the manufacturing side. So I hope you were able to learn a little bit more about homology today. I won't be available for the Q&A, but please do send any questions to my contact information here, ksarno at homologymedicines.com. So glad you were able to listen today and we hope to hear from you soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sarno. Um, all about the speakers are from the United States. Thank you again, each of you for great presentation. I just quickly remind that if our audience has any questions to the speakers, uh, please feel free to send them in the chat box in the YouTube channel. Okay. The following three speakers are from Taiwan. First, let's welcome Dr. Pei En Guo, Distinguished Research Fellow and Director under the Institute of Biomedical Sciences from Academia Sinica in Taiwan, our top research institution. He will provide us a general picture of Taiwan's precision medicine development. Please, Dr. Guo. Good morning. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak to you today. I want to spend a few minutes to tell you about the Taiwan Precision Medicine Initiative that has been going on for the last two years or so. When we think about precision medicine, we can think of it as uh, applying to cancer, where we do DNA and RNA analysis so that we can identify the drivers of the tumor and tailor treatment and predict outcome. And today we have heard and we'll hear more about uh, the precision medicine as applied to rare diseases, where we do once again DNA analysis to make molecular diagnosis and then hopefully can treat according to the diagnosis and even perform uh, family planning. But what hasn't been done too well is uh, the precision medicine of common disease, where we identify uh, the risk for common disease before they occur, and then try to tailor management for these diseases and also for managing uh, drug response. Now, common diseases are very different from cancer or rare genetic disease because they affect all of us. And it's caused by many risk variants on multiple genes. And some of the risk variants are population specific and the diseases are highly influenced by environment. 
And because of these features, if we look at whole genome sequencing data of one individual in isolation, it is actually not interpretable until we accumulate tens of thousands of millions of people's uh, data, this will not be feasible. So to implement precision medicine for common diseases then, uh, the key is really to identify uh, the high risk individuals using a disease risk prediction approach. And this is what the Taiwan Precision Medicine Initiative is about. So we want to figure out a way to come up with a reference set of data that we can then use it to tailor treatment and health management based on someone's genetic profile and other information from the clinical data. So for this project, we started by leveraging the Taiwan Biobank's uh, DNA sequencing uh, result uh, with about 1,500 uh, sets of whole genome sequencing data. We came up with uh, the Taiwan reference genomes. And using that data, we have designed and manufactured a Taiwan Precision Medicine single nucleotide polymorphism array. And we are now in the process of uh, recruiting a million people who will consent to give us their comprehensive clinical record and a small DNA sample for us to type and provide the genetic profiles to the study. And as of last month, we have recruited 300,000 people already into the project. And we hope to finish this project within the next two years. Now, for this uh, project, it's a consortium approach where Academia Sinica partners with 15 hospitals across Taiwan uh, to recruit these uh, participants and also to return the results to them. Based on these uh, 15 partner hospitals, uh, their patient base is about 30% of the entire uh, Taiwan population. So just to back up a little bit, when we think about precision medicine, we want to gather all the information we can to predict someone's uh, disease risk and try to mitigate the uh, disease from occurring. So it's a prevention-centric uh, model. If this is possible, that's the ideal. However, sometimes it's not possible. We know that sometimes uh, people have a particular risk for cancer or for other diseases that we know, but we cannot stop it from happening. So in that case, we would like to figure out how to make the diagnosis early and treat early. And this is, would be a good outcome because when we treat the uh, condition early, sometimes it could be curative. However, there are places or times when we cannot stop the disease from progressing. So in this case, we want to figure out how to mitigate uh, the serious sequela, including uh, making sure that the medicines that we use will not harm the patient. And also, we can prevent uh, the more serious uh, endpoint of these uh, diseases. Now, risk prediction is not new. For example, in the US, uh, the National Cancer Institute has this uh, breast cancer risk assessment tool that people can enter information and come out with a risk uh, prediction. So in this case, I have entered some risk factors for a patient. This hypothetical uh, woman uh, is 44 years old, white, uh, had her period early, and childbearing late. On top of that, I added uh, two first-degree relatives with breast cancer. So with this profile, this patient, instead of having a 0.9% five-year risk for developing breast cancer, she actually has uh, almost a two-and-a-half-fold uh, risk 
at 2.3% within the next five years. And for the lifetime, instead of 12% for the average patient, uh, this woman has a 26, uh, more than double the chance of having breast cancer in her lifetime. Now, what is interesting, though, is that the overriding driving force is actually genetics. So in this case, this patient has uh, two relatives with breast cancer, giving her a pretty significant uh, lifetime risk. If we change this number while holding everything else the same, now we have no relatives. The risk actually came back to almost normal. Uh, with uh, these other risks, uh, she has a lifetime chance of developing breast cancer only 1% higher than the average. So to drive the, the point even closer to home, uh, this is a study uh, done by a group in uh, Michigan where they looked at 2,000 individuals, uh, blue are the males and red are the females, and looking at their height based on genetic prediction alone. So we just put in the genetic factors. You can predict someone's height. And then when you compare that to the actual height, it turns out that the correlation is, is very, very well, very, very good. If you're a mathematician, you say that this is a wonderful result. But as a layperson or as a biologist, then you say, well, what about this spread? If someone is predicted to be 178 uh, centimeters in height, while well, this person can be as short as 163 centimeters or 190 centimeters. So this tells you that genetics is only partially determinant because anyone with this uh, prediction height, predicted height, will never be uh, shorter than, say, 165. So these other factors there, then, are the things that we can control, environmental factors, exercise, nutrition, and so forth. And this actually gives us hope that for common diseases, this is okay. If we can predict, then we can bring someone's high risk down to acceptable risk. So this is an approach that is not based on particular genes or particular variants, but it's a big group of variants. So this is what we call the polygenic risk score approach. You take a person's uh, you know, comprehensive genetic profile and then use that profile to predict someone's disease risk. And with this approach, you actually need to have many, many variants, and you require a very, very large cohort to give you that precision and the accuracy that you need and the power that you can generate these risk scores. And needless to say, uh, this is a very complicated calculation, and you require uh, artificial intelligence algorithms. Now, what is uh, becoming, uh, you know, known over time is that uh, this polygenic risk score approach is population specific. So because of that, we need algorithms that are based on a specific population and then uh, going with, with uh, the particular population history to arrive at the goal of identifying high risk patients so that we can implement early intervention. So we decided that uh, we should do this for the Chinese population because it's the biggest population in the world, accounting for about 20% of the world population. So how do we come up with polygenic risk scores for the Chinese? Well, I want to tell you that Taiwan is actually the perfect place for this because Taiwan has a very homogeneous population. About 96% of the population are Han Chinese. And Taiwan has national health insurance that collects comprehensive data on the individuals. And this has been going on for the last 30 years. And then uh, Taiwan has really good electronic medical records and the records are actually uh, done in English in many cases, where it's therefore easily uh, searchable. And as I mentioned before, 
uh, this is a really good place to do it because the results will have high impact, uh, being able to apply to all Han Chinese around the world. So this project actually has two complementary arms. The first arm has to do with known specific gene variants that is uh, useful today for patient health. And this is based on published uh, literature over the years. And so with this, we can look at mutations that can cause uh, rare genetic disorders, uh, variants that predict uh, cancer risk, uh, drug use and uh, drug dosing needs, and also carriers for uh, known gene variants that uh, cause rare genetic disorders. The second arm, though, is what is uh, most exciting for common diseases, because uh, this is the arm where we have markers that can be used to analyze the big cohort to identify Taiwan-specific disease risk variants based on genome-wide association study type approaches. And once we have that, uh, these genetic profiles can help us uh, figure out the guidelines for management that include environmental and lifestyle factors to help mitigate the risk for high-risk individuals. And the other interesting thing for this project is that the clinical data will be updated in real time, and also uh, any new discoveries will be uh, incorporated into the guidelines in real time. So for the array design, uh, this is specific for Taiwan. And the first arm, we have genetic testing markers. So we have 124,000 genetic tests in one experiment. And then uh, we have uh, about 580,000 markers for genetic profiling. And this is a unique test because uh, for stable germline DNA, uh, this test has uh, the benefit of having to be done only once in a lifetime. So for the rest of the time, I will show you a little bit about the, the early results based on the genetic testing arm alone. Uh, so we used the array and looked at the first 100,000 100, people from the Taiwan Bao Bank. And uh, so these are some of the observations. So the first observation is that about 21% of the population, one-fifth of the population, actually carry a known mutation causing, uh, I mean, a disease causing mutation in known genes. Now, I have to add that these are recessive traits. That means that you need to have both of your uh, genes copies in your cells to be defective because you get, before you get the disease. So these people are mostly carriers. They do not have the disease, but they carry this mutation such that if they marry someone with a mutation in the same gene, their children will be at risk for having the real full-blown uh, condition. So if you look at these genes uh, and the conditions, uh, you see that uh, one of them is actually an X-linked disorder where the males with this uh, mutation actually will have the disease. And this is pretty common. About 2.5% of the population carry a mutation on this uh, G6PD gene that can cause uh, hemolytic anemia uh, in the right situations. And then there are uh, uh, gene mutations in Wilson disease, which uh, has defect for copper metabolism and so forth. So one-fifth of the population has something that we uh, should worry about in family planning. Another discovery is that 5% of the population, actually, uh, they have mutations for dominant traits. That means that these people have these traits. Most of them are not very serious traits, such as uh, uh, mild hearing loss and, and so forth. But there is one condition uh, called pedasal, which is a small vessel disease affecting uh, our brain that can cause a stroke. So in this condition, uh, it's the most common single gene disorder that, that we know 
that cause stroke. Uh, so these strokes are usually small and progressive. So before the strokes affect essential areas of the brain, there are no symptoms. But in someone who has a, a major uh, problem over time, then you can see all these white areas that are affected by the stroke. So it turns out that uh, the notch three gene is the culprit. And there are over 200 mutations on this gene uh, found across the world. But it, it, interestingly, 70% of the Taiwan patients carry a specific mutation called R544C. And this uh, is very pre prevalent in Taiwan, Fujian, and also South Korea. And uh, so about almost 1% of the population in Taiwan have this mutation. But you say, well, we don't have uh, that many patients with stroke in Taiwan. So what is the, the situation? It turns out that uh, there are several small studies done on patients with, these, um, with this particular mutation and see that even before they have symptoms, there are evidence, uh, there is evidence of uh, small strokes in the brain. So this is an important uh, thing that now we are doing a bigger study to uh, measure the risk of these uh, patients with the mutation in terms of developing stroke. Now, another finding is that about 3% of the population have uh, familial cancer risk. So these are people with uh, uh, different uh, mutations that we know will cause like colon cancer or breast cancer and so forth. So for each gene, the population size is not that big, but even half a percent of a country of Taiwan's size of 23 million people, you're still talking about 100,000 or more people with these uh, conditions. And so this is very important because just like uh, most countries, Taiwan has a cancer screening program where anyone over age 50 will be uh, screened for colon cancer. However, when you look at this, you can see that uh, over 10% of the people develop uh, uh, who developed colon cancer uh, under the age of 50. So if we can use genetics to find them ahead of time, that would be tremendous. Same thing with breast cancer. We have screening programs for people over 45 or if their family history, age 40. But then, as you can see, uh, quite a few new cases are found in younger people. So then the idea then is to find high-risk individuals and change their lifestyle, do screening tests early, and treat them before symptomatic. And then uh, we also found about almost 90% of the people have some uh, risk variance for toxic drug reaction or adverse uh, drug reactions. And these are uh, cases where if we can identify them early, we can remove those who will have problems with medicines, change your dosing and so forth, and only treat those with, uh, without any serious problems. So to end the talk, I just want to say that we are, in this project, using big data to identify high-risk individuals and then combining that with uh, pollution data, uh, activity data, lifestyle data to come up with uh, risk prediction. And then with the risk prediction, we can uh, categorize people as high risk or low risk and then give them advice and tailor the uh, treatment and screening strategies and even optimizing their lifestyle or uh, drug usage and nutrition. So to conclude, uh, I want to say that uh, the two arms of the project are really helpful. So the genetic testing will identify high risk for serious conditions. And then uh, the profiles, we can also identify high risk people. So we can preemptively genotype the risk variants. We can lead to optimize uh, medication use. We can lead to early screening of high risk groups to incure, uh, increase the cure rate. And then uh, I want to end by reiterating how important it is to do this project in Taiwan, because it's a perfect place to implement precision medicine for common diseases. And the data for uh, this cohort 
will be useful for many research studies and uh, useful for the 1.5 billion Han Chinese around the world. Much for your uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Guo. The following speaker is Dr. Wu Liangfu, a professor from the Department of Medical Genetics from National Taiwan University Hospital. He will share with us some clinical cases to highlight the uh, importance of advancing precision medicine with next generation genetic testing and gene therapy. The floor is yours, Dr. Hu. Thank you for inviting me to this very important conference. So my topic today is advancing precision medicine with next generation sequencing and uh, gene therapy. So I, I will just introduce you what happened to my institute. So my institute, the National Taiwan University Hospital, actually it starts from like a hundred years ago, starting from this very old house. And uh, we built more house behind uh, this uh, beautiful building. And then after a while, we uh, have this main hospital. This is a huge uh, uh, hospital complex. And we develop uh, all the uh, modern medicine uh, in this place. Uh, around 10 years ago, uh, so we have this very colorful, beautiful building. So this is the uh, children's hospital and uh, also the place that I am located. So I'm a pediatrician uh, in uh, genetics. Yeah. And just recently, um, this year, uh, we have uh, this cancer center. This is very important. Yeah. But at the, at the same time, if we look at uh, uh, what happened uh, to the sequencing, so actually the sequencing starting from this very traditional uh, polyapramide gel electrophoresis. Uh, actually, I have done that by my own hands it's years and years ago. And then we have uh, this, uh, uh, we, we call this uh, the color Sanger sequencing. Uh, we know that uh, using this uh, massive array of uh, big sequencer, uh, uh, so people the uh, first time sequencing the whole human genome. Uh, at the same time, because the sequencing is not so convenient, uh, so there are other uh, convenient tools that has been used uh, uh, made many in the uh, clinical setting. Um, for example, uh, this is, is uh, um, the HPLC or denaturing HPLC. So you can see the peak uh, different a little bit uh, because of the mutation. Uh, more recently, uh, it is still used uh, for, for this one, it's, it's a melting curve. Uh, so certainly uh, we can use melting curve uh, to see the difference, but this is just for a very small piece of uh, DNA and uh, not really for all the uh, uh, nucleotide. Yeah. And then finally, we have this uh, next generation sequencing. So I just show a picture of the a, a, a chip. So in a very small area, we can have uh, one dot is like a one sequencing. So we have a uh, kind of millions of sequencing that happen in a uh, same uh, sick. So the hospital evolved and the technology evolved. Uh, so then I will introduce you what happened now in uh, this hospital employing the most uh, recent uh, technology in both NGS diagnosis and uh, also gene therapy. So talk about uh, NGS diagnosis first. Um, as an academic center, we are more focused on more comprehensive type of uh, uh, NGS. So we're talking about the omics like genomics, exome, and also transcriptome. And we apply it uh, first to single gene diseases or Mendelian diseases is my expertise. And then uh, after we got enough uh, experience, now we uh, apply that to cancer. Um, certainly for single gene disease, we, we know that for a disease, I don't know if you can see this is the dilated cardiomyopathy. This is like a, a few dozen genes that can 
cause this, this condition. Um, for cancer, actually, the change in the genome uh, is more diverse. It's, uh, other than the point mutation, we uh, want to see uh, copy number changes, expression changes, and also uh, structural changes. It's because of nature of uh, cancer. And this is the um, uh, map uh, explaining the use of uh, different NGS technology into the panel, axon, and uh, genome. So this is a cumulated map, and uh, you can see that um, now majority is the red, this is the axon, and uh, we have now very little because of the, the line that, that doesn't increase much uh, recently. Uh, so we now majorly apply the whole axon sequencing uh, to uh, patients with features of uh, genetic diseases. It's because uh, we now can assess to this uh, very powerful machine. This is the uh, NovaSeq uh, uh, sequencer. Um, but over the past few years, I think uh, in NGS diagnosis, actually, uh, what we most proud of uh, is this uh, rapid trio uh, WES analysis uh, for acute illness. Um, is that so? NGS is not a tool that uh, we enjoy. We genetics enjoy. We want to help those patients uh, who are trapped in the ICU in the uh, emergent uh, 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 service that uh, they maybe have uh, some uh, genetic condition. So we need to really uh, uh, give the answer uh, as quick as possible. And so we spent like one, two years, then we set up uh, this uh, very quick pipeline. So starting from DNA extraction, library sequencing, and uh, for clinical reading, uh, we want to give the answer in one working week, uh, for example. But certainly this is not uh, the fastest in the world, but uh, th this, this is a regular setting. So we still, uh, after initially we found by most, uh, after uh, this uh, funding period, uh, we, we just conduct this uh, regularly. In order to achieve that goal, uh, the reading is very important. Um, so we spend much of our time uh, to create our own uh, software to help the reading of the sequence. Uh, because after an exome uh, uh, analysis, uh, we may have like a uh, 100,000 variant. We can see 100,000 variant in a single case. Uh, for uh, dominant disease, it's only one mutation. For recessive, it's two mutations. We need to find the one or two among the 100,000. So we have this software. Uh, so we have a very comprehensive annotation of all the variant. Um, then uh, we connect the variation of the uh, genome to the clinical information uh, of the patient. And then we can uh, do this is AI assist, uh, assisted um, uh, test mining. And uh, uh, with all this uh, method that uh, we can uh, have the answer uh, in a very quick way. So uh, this is the service uh, to all over Taiwan. Uh, so we uh, were connected to with uh, almost all the uh, major medical centers in Taiwan. Uh, we have published this, and this is the uh, one of the uh, uh, um, summary slide. Uh, it told us that in uh, half of the cases, uh, we can find a specific diagnosis, a genetic diagnosis for the patient. And more important uh, is that um, many of those diagnoses that uh, we never met before, it, it means that by clinical diagnosis by our eyes, by our chemistry, we never make diagnosis of uh, those patients. So they are uh, very important. And um, this is my favorite favorite case. I always show this case uh, in uh, my lecture. Uh, so this is a previously healthy four-year-old girl. Um, but it's one day uh, that she experienced a sudden loss of consciousness. 
and then the family sent her to the, the hospital. Uh, then the EKG here is show a ventricular fibrillation. Um, but the, the doctor just rescued uh, the girl. Um, but uh, du during the uh, a few days uh, she was in the uh, uh, hospital, the ventricular fibrillation just recurred. And they, they don't know what happened until uh, we tell them that, oh, it's a mutation in a gene, we call this as RYR2. And uh, this gene will cause a disease, it's over here, it's catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So in brief, uh, this disease, in this disease, the heart is uh, super sensitive to epinephrine. We know that uh, we have a stress, then we have a secretion of epinephrine. So during the uh, episode, during the first episode, the, the, the little girl experienced an, an diarrhea, so it's a stress. Uh, when we put the child in ICU, anything happened, anything wrong, cardio assist, we give her epinephrine. So then we know that we cannot give her epinephrine. So just with this very simple understanding, uh, we, we didn't uh, try to uh, insert an intracardiac uh, uh, defibrillator, uh, just the change in medical care. And then we have this little girl is uh, like uh, three, four years later, is, uh, uh, she uh, lived uh, uh, very happy. Yeah. Then uh, the second, we will introduce just uh, our recent uh, development in uh, cancer diagnosis by NGS. Uh, we will mention here is uh, whole axon sequencing and also the whole RNA seq analysis. So we sequence, we try to sequence all the DNA and all the RNA uh, in the, the cancer sen the cancer sample. Um, but, but what we do after whole axon sequencing? Certainly, we will do mutation analysis. But we will also do copy number, do microsatellite, homologous recombination defect, and the tumor mutation burden. So then these things, well, in combination, tell us what happened to this cancer cell. So I just introduced uh, all those uh, knowledge to you. Uh, for example, um, microsatellite, uh, it means that uh, a small piece of DNA uh, with that, that short repeat. Uh, we know that uh, if the cell um, uh, has uh, some problem like a DNA mismatch repair deficiency, and then the repair of uh, this microsatellite will become uh, uh, incomplete, then the microsatellite will change in size. Yeah. So um, why, why should we do that? Because uh, this is concerned with drug. So for this drug and FDA say that um, if you have uh, the instability high, then you can use this drug. Yeah. It's a uh, very similar uh, with this uh, homologous recombination defect. Uh, we know that uh, this happened uh, especially to BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation. But certainly you can you can sequence BRCA1 too, but there are other genes that uh, they also uh, are, are responsible for this uh, H uh, homologous recombination. And sometimes it's difficult to find a mutation. So the, the way we do that, we find the consequences of uh, this uh, 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 genome instability. The reason is that uh, even for cancer cell, uh, they need a uh, Sometimes some kind of uh, repair, so it can be uh, this double strand break repair or single strand break repair. And once we know that the cell, the cancer cell, is defective in double strand break, and then we can use a certain drug to block another pathway, and then the cell died. Um, so it's also uh, FDA approved um, some drug for HRD positive uh, uh, cancer, for example. Um, the next one is a tumor mutation burden, and this is also a very famous term. Um, the, the sticking process is, is the, the way to, to do it is, is quite simple because uh, we do a lot of sequencing. 
and then we find all the mutation and we calculate uh, the, the density of the mutation, like uh, for example, how many mutation per one million base pair, uh, uh, for example. And the, the, the basic concept is that, um, so we can have a, a, a cancer that uh, they don't have a lot of mutation. Yeah. And we, we're not talking about the germline mutation, fundamental mutation. This is mutation occur in the cancer. And we have other cancer that uh, they have a lot of mutation. They have a high mutation burden. So the general general thought is that uh, when the TMB is low, I do about favor standard care. If the TMB is higher, maybe uh, the cancer can be more sensitive to uh, immunotherapy. Now, again, this is what suggested by FDA. Yeah. So this is the uh, summary of a uh, report for for axon sequencing for cancer. Uh, certainly we do all this from this uh, paraffin block uh, because we need to know where is the cancer uh, tissues. Yeah. So uh, from the report, it is a very comprehensive report. Uh, you can see here, we know the mutations. Uh, we know if there is a copy number change. We know the uh, microcyte instability tumor mutation burden and also um, HRD score. Um, with all these things, and, and uh, I, I think uh, an oncologist can uh, use the best tool, uh, the, the best way uh, to treat the cancer patient. But sometimes we, uh, uh, it's not just enough to analyze the DNA because uh, for certain tumor, uh, the the driver the driver the uh, event that triggers the cancer is the gene fusion. So after gene fusion, uh, some uh, likely is the oncogene being activated. Um, so at this time, we need to uh, analyze the RNA. So in a traditional way, uh, we will convert RNA to cDNA, and uh, uh, we have a certain. Uh, 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 cancer panel, they do PCR, try to catch up a uh, uh, known uh, fragment of uh, gene fusion. Um, but uh, as, I, as I said, uh, uh, if, if there's one test that can do everything, yeah, uh, because uh, you need a one PCR for one fusion gene. So uh, we're sequencing all the RNA in the tumor sample and we just do bioinformatics analysis. Um, for example, this is a fusion gene analysis. Uh, we very confidently uh, detect uh, this uh, 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 very typical the BCRC uh, ABO uh, translocation. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, uh, with this, all the sequencing data, uh, we can have other uh, information from tumor, even from the RNA, for example, uh, we can uh, know the coverage, and we also can know the uh, sequencing, uh, sequence change or uh, single nucleotide polymorphism in this RNA seq, and we can uh, follow the clonality of, uh, of those cells. Uh, so uh, if we just can coverage, uh, you can see here is the chromosome four is uh, uh, got uh, more coverage than other chromosome, and also it's a chromosome four, six, seven, and we have 14, uh, 17, 18. Uh, so this uh, actually this is a leukemia, this, and they call this is a polypoidity, and uh, so this cancer uh, has a high instability in their genome. So this means something to the hematologist. Okay, so uh, in the rest of time, I will uh, describe another uh, development um, uh, uh, we have done in our hospital. This is the gene therapy. Yeah. But for gene therapy, we can do direct better administration. We can do S vivo that we get a cell out and uh, we put um, the antivirus into the cell and the transfusion is back. 
But also we can use mRNA and oligonucleotide. I think mRNA therapy now is very famous is because of the COVID-19 vaccine. But uh, essentially, uh, we think it's, this is also part of the uh, gene therapy. Yeah. But what we do is a, a very uh, specific disease. Uh, this is very rare or rare disease. And the enzyme, uh, the gene, the uh, aromatic uh, air amino acid carboxylase ADC is involved in the conversion of uh, dopa to dopamine or beta hydroxy tryptophan to serotonin. And then dopamine substrate of uh, epinephrine and noepinephrine. Yeah. Um, Dopamine deficiency, you may know in adult patient, this is Parkinson's disease. Um, so dopamine, uh, the, the very important pathway is the cell in this uh, brain stem substitution nigra. They send dopamine to striatum the, the putamen. And that will regulate uh, the cortex motor activity. Um, if the child got a congenital deficiency of this enzyme, uh, we call this as a country ADC deficiency. This is a very uh, severe uh, motor defect of the children. So the uh, affected children, the typical cases, they have no development. Uh, they never have head control, never sit up. Uh, so this is a very severe one. So uh, what we have done is uh, we use the AV virus. Uh, we put the DDC CNA uh, in the virus and driven by a promoter. And we grow this vector into this GMP grade and we inject the virus into the abdomen uh, of the patient. And this too uh, actually is the tour for deep brain stimulation uh, is in surgery for Parkinson's disease. So we use this um, uh, well-established tour and this very simple ARV construct. And we can see that uh, this before treatment, there's no signal. And after treatment, uh, they have a signal for um, ADC activity. So this is the DOPA PET. Um, you may be surprised, uh, surprised because we have done that for years. So we start in the first case, uh, actually this is 2010. So it's more than 10 years ago. So we do our first case and at that time there's uh, even no uh, animal model. So this is a first in human. This only can only be done in a compassionately used way. But after a while we have uh, uh, enough data, then we uh, went into a true phase one, two, and now we are in this uh, phase two B uh, period. And at the same time, uh, we established our own mouse model and uh, we done um, a lot of uh, research uh, in this neurotransmitter deficiency. Um, so currently uh, 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 we transfer this technology to PTC uh, therapeutics and now uh, PTCs want to bring this product to uh, US and uh, also uh, Europe. I just show here uh, one figure to demonstrate the efficacy of uh, this gene therapy. Uh, the y-axis, this is a uh, motor scale. Uh, it, it means that um, um, it's a, a gross motor, uh, spine motor, gross motor. The higher score is means of a better performance. And as uh, S is this, the age that a patient uh, received gene therapy. This is in months, so this is two years of age. Uh, you see that we treat uh, really uh, uh, many of the young patient by um, this uh, um, surgery to uh, inject the virus into their brain. Um, so if we just see those uh, baseline spot, uh, you can see that uh, every patient, uh, young or old, uh, when they receive the treatment, they have a very low uh, PDMS2 score. Uh, as I told you that uh, they never sit up, they never have care control. 
but uh, once they receive the gene therapy, uh, here is the period of uh, two years, three years, you can see that they have a very good uh, motor development. Uh, currently, we have like four or five patients, they can walk uh, freely uh, by themselves. Yeah. So I think this is a uh, um, very straightforward, effective, and also safe uh, gene therapy. And uh, we hope that this uh, gene therapy can be uh, approved uh, in the uh, near nature, in near future. Um, my colleagues in the hospital, they also joined the international gene therapy trial. So this is the very important uh, gene therapy for SMA. Um, this is my colleague Nancy Chen. So they do their first infusion uh, in the ICU. Uh, you see that this is a very uh, young infant. Um, the trial in Taiwan actually uh, is quite important uh, because uh, we focus on pre-symptomatic patient uh, because uh, we think this is a neurodegenerative disease. So age of treatment is very important. And for that purpose, actually, uh, we set up a newborn screen. So we are the first published newborn screen for uh, spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, so we have patient de developer by uh, newborn screen so they can be uh, treated like uh, one or two weeks after birth, uh, we think that uh, they will have a better uh, response for uh, well, the gene therapy than the late treated patient. Yeah. So this is all I want to present to you uh, today. Um, so we have introduced you like uh, Nancy Chen, and this is Nina Lee. Um, both of them, uh, they were my trainee, but now they are uh, both full professor. Um, so over here, this is Chinese character. It, it means that uh, real disorders. Um, so we want to uh, use the best science to give a best service to uh, the, the most vulnerable patient, those uh, patients with real disorders. Thank you very much. Okay. Our last speaker is Dr. Yu Tai Wang, Director of Technology for AIoT and Biomedical Information Service Division under National Center for High Performance Computing, abbreviation as NCHC in Taiwan. This center, founded in 1991, is Taiwan's only one national level supercomputing center to process large computing storage, networking, and platform integration. NCHC, I think, is like infrastructure to provide libraries, software, and packages for analysis and computing in precision medicine. The floor is yours, Dr. Wang. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Wang Yu Tai from the National Center for High Performance Computing. NCHC is our abbreviation. Today, I'm very happy to share with you some information on the data services and cloud platform of the NCHC. I'm the division director of AIoT technology and biomedical information service division of the NCHC. First of all, I will quickly take you to understand the importance of data and genome sequencing technology and what kind of the challenges we will face. Next, I will briefly introduce to you the role played by NCHC in Taiwan for scientific, scientific researches. Finally, I will introduce to you the existing plans of the NCHC and the future. We all know that the human society is currently experiencing a real pandemic. At the same time, it is also very rare that scientists have found advanced weapons to fight back against the pandemic. The one of well-known weapons is mRNA vaccine, but this vaccine technology is so noble, we need to know it is safe enough and effective enough. The RNA vaccine has created a dilemma 
in the uh, practical application of biotechnology. The first situation is that the pandemic is severe. The second, it is safe enough. Is it safe enough? And the third, how effectiveness is. Because of its own needs, Israel has used a very clever strategy to, to talk to the pharmaceutical companies. They not only buy vaccines at a higher price, but also provide information on the clinical response of the vaccinator to the vaccines so that the vaccine companies can have the data to identify the vaccine's safety and efficacy. We know it is a kind of a win-win strategy, very successful. First, Israel citizens get vaccination with priority and have sufficient protection to maintain economic development. Second, pharmaceutical companies can get the data for vaccine validation and safety verification in the third phase of clinical trials. <clears throat> As I just mentioned, this vaccine seems to be very successful, successful for so far. It used MRA technology. This technology is actually a kind of learning from our enemy. Unlike ordinary virus, it kidnaps cells and continuously produce copies of its cell to invade the next victim. This vaccine also used the human's own mechanism as known in the central dogma of biology using the design antigen mRNA sequence to enter ordinary cells to produce a large number of viral outer shield spine protein fragments, which are the outer peripheral of the virus. Protein fragment and the further trigger an immune response to produce neutralizing antibodies. There was a saying in Chinese no novels that take your own and give back to you. Sorry, take your way and give back to you. And today's scientists are using the, this philosophy to fight back. But to do this, we must understand the genome of the virus before we have the opportunity to find the key sequence fragments to design a vaccine. Genome sequencing technology is a very powerful tool. It directly provides a genetic blueprint of the organisms. By using this technology, scientists can find gen genetic related disease, including cancer, based on the uh, special biomarkers on the genome. In fact, by using genome sequencing technology, scientists have found a few genome type difference between Western and Eastern people. Even in cancer research, the characteristic of cancers in similar organs of the oriental, of the oriental and Western, Westerners may be different. And this technology also provides disease progression and important information about uh, medic medications, etc. I'm not very clear. Do you know how much data can be generated after using genome sequencing technology? I will make an estimation here. According to the data of the Ministry of Health and Welfare, there are uh, 70,000 new cancer patients in Taiwan every year. The number is very stunning. In addition, genome sequencing not only for cancer, but also could be used for checking 
whether there is a genetic disease or even predict or prevent disease occurs. We can imagine that there may, there may be 180 a thousand newborns in year in Taiwan, their parents will definitely be concerned about genetic disease, and they will be definitely want to find possible preventive information before the disease occurs. The Taiwanese population is 23 million. We think they should concern their health situation. If they want to do, they will do it. Humans are not the only species on the earth. Other species are closely related to human survival. For example, our food comes from other organisms. Sim sim similarly, genetic sequencing will definitely be used on them. Then, humans will get sick other organisms will also get sick. And we also have to use the same technology to solve the problem, such as huge amount of sequencing information. How should we go, uh, how, sorry, how should we do? This directory leads to a consequence. How do, how do we complete all the analy analysis work in a limited time? The NCHC is Taiwan's only supercomputer center for public service. We maintain Taiwan's largest supercomputer. We also provide academic research and high bandwidth network backbone service, linking domestic universities and research institutions. In the future, this network facility will be connected to various government agencies including important institutions such as medical centers. The NCHC is a research unit under the National Applied Research Laboratories and the National Applied Research, research Laboratories is a non-profit organization under the Ministry of Science and Technology. NCHC expects to become a world-class supercomputer center and data center. We also hope that through advanced information technology platform supports, new discoveries in science and new developments in the technology can be made. We are playing the role of an enabler. I present our lat latest uh, computer is Taiwania 3, which has a total of 9 and 16 nodes and 50,000 cores. We also provide network backbone service with network bandwidth up to 100 gigabit. We also provide two 10 gigabits international networks to the US. We have a total of three places in Taiwan to set up computing rooms and offices. The headquarters is in Xinzhou, and the others are located in Taichung and Tainan. We also provide remote data backup services our facilities have obtained various certification, including three certifications related to privacy protections. These certifications are also recognized internationally. Meanwhile, we have also developed 
relevant information security technologies for detecting attacks to improve the protection of our core facilities. In 2020, the NCHC got a con contract for Taiwan's uh, for Taiwan Biobank, and a copy of their data will be placed in NCHC. In the past, if scientists in Taiwan wanted to use the data of Taiwan Biobank, they had to move the physical hard drive to the academic the academic academic cynica and wait for the data to be transmitted. There are a lot of information burden. At present, at, at present, users of the Taiwan Biobank can download the data from NCHC or in a clever way, applying an account at the NCHC, then user can access and analyze their approved data in the environment of the NCHC. By this way, it may minimize information burden. The biomedical information service of NCHC is called LINES. Through this web page, you can see the various services we currently provide, including protein structure, genome sequencing an analysis, and imaging analysis environment, in addition to the Taiwan Biobank. In the future, we will have clinical information related to tumors and neurological disease from medical centers, which will be available to academic research institutions and biotech commercial companies. This, pro this project is a sustainable platform for big data in health. It is a large scale pro project jointly implemented by Ministry of Econ Economy Ministry of Health and Welfare, Ministry of Science and Technology. Its purpose is to promote innovation research and development in biomedical industry so that people across, across the country can enjoy the benefit of precision health. The special feature of this project is joint construction of a precision health database through cross department for, for operation. The, impl the implemented strategy include prospective data collection, linking existing database, in addition to providing academic research and database also hopes to provide industrial applications. At, at present, there are a total of eight medical centers that provide information covering 10 kinds of cancers and two kinds of cranial nerve related disease. The collected data includes EHR, questionnaire, genome sequencing data, tissue slides, medical images, etc. And a case, and it is a case-centric database will be established. Finally, we can expect that in the next few years, we will establish a one-stop data service in Taiwan. From data inquiry, selection, application, or post approval data analysis and storage, etc. We will also provide file standard APIs for data exchange in future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have a very fruitful program today.
for the remaining, I think 10 to 15 minutes, we will move on to the panel discussion session. I see all of our panelists are uh, getting online now, and I would like to take this opportunity to express again my sincere appreciation to all the panelists joining us, especially to those from the United States. It's quite late in the evening, and thank you for taking the time. Let me quickly introduce today's panelists. First, Dr. Li Sang Wang, professor from University of Pennsylvania. Our second uh, panelist, Dr. Pei En Guo, Distinguished Research Fellow from Academia Sinica in Taiwan. The third panelist, Dr. Wu Liang Fu, Professor from National Taiwan University Hospital. Hello. The fourth, Dr. Yu Tai Wang, Director for AIoT and Biomedical Information Service Division under NCHC. Okay, the final one, Dr. Wang Ping Li, Research Assistant Professor from University of Pennsylvania, a colleague of Dr. Li San Wang. Uh, in University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she has many collaborators in Taiwan and she joined us as a special guest today. So Hello. let me kick off the first question and then I will ask some questions that we receive from the audience. The first question is very general and I would like to ask each panelist. In your perspective, did you see the gap between Taiwan and the United States in terms of precision medicine. How will you provide suggestions and comments to Taiwanese government policymakers or, gov uh, or Taiwanese pharmaceutical companies to prepare for developing international collaborations? Also, any particular area you think we have opportunities and Taiwan has advantages either in diagnostics or therapeutics or any application diseases like in um, immunology, oncology, Alzheimer, anything that you think Taiwan has advantage to tr attract U.S. or international collaborators. So let me start with Dr. Li San Wang. Uh, please uh, unmute yourself. Yes. Yeah, well, I'll be brief, but I, I must say that uh, Taiwan has a lot of many, many strengths. And uh, uh, Dr. Guo made a really compelling point about uh, Taiwan as an excellent place for studying different kinds of ca uh, common rare diseases. And there are a lot of uh, strengths uh, on, say, you know, Dr. Hu's examples for uh, therapy development and Dr. Wang's uh, talking about, of course, we all know the strengths of uh, computing and electronics and engineering in Taiwan. So uh, like there are many ways we can explore this. I like my personal preference is I, I think uh, international collaboration because I work on common diseases uh, is really important, especially for uh, making the data available to international researchers. That's a great way to uh, bring impact. So so we have the data to the more people analyzing, the more uh, new ideas that might emerge. I, I would say one of the best examples is uh, the UK Biobank, which is widely available to the entire community and think about how the impact is available. Uh, so so that, that's my one suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang. And Dr. Guo? Yes. Um, so I totally agree with uh, Professor Wang about, uh, you know, data. Uh, I think the biggest thing that Taiwan can do is actually acquiring more data. Um, you know, because uh, no matter what kind of AI tools you have and, and whatnot, uh, data that is the most important. Just think of Netflix and think of Amazon. Uh, before they were brokers of information, but now they create content. You know, it's the same thing with, with uh, precision medicine. Whoever has the content has the upper hand. And so I think uh, just like uh, Professor Wong's uh, involvement with the uh, Alzheimer's disease cohort, uh, there are many good cohorts in Taiwan that we should acquire data for them. And then, you know, the, uh, the IT, uh, you know, skills that we have, the infrastructure we have will kind of make this data uh, useful and valuable to everyone. 
so I think the government, um, you know, need to consider that and also provide the uh, environment good for data sharing and data analysis. And, uh, you know, the collaboration, you know, we can pick the brains of the smart people in the U.S., right? They have 15 times population than Taiwan. And they have more resources and more people. Um, so we have the advantage of a homogeneous, really well uh, uh, treated, really good medical system, really good uh, clinical data. So we should take advantage of that and uh, use that as a collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Guo. Uh, Dr. Hu? Um, yes. So I want to uh, talk about uh, uh, te technology or uh, product development. Uh, so we heard about uh, the uh, uh, progress from the company like uh, Amicus or Homology. So, so they are a, a pretty pretty sizable uh, 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 um, operation. So they almost have everything. Yeah, but I, I think uh, we we in Taiwan uh, we we have uh, many accident, uh, especially this uh, clinical scientist. And uh, we also have good uh, uh, basic scientists. We we can have a good idea. Uh, we have uh, some uh, local situation patient uh, group. Uh, just as example, my study for ADC deficiency is, is quite unique disease uh, um, in in this island. Yeah, um, but but um, uh, uh, to develop a real medicine or gene therapy, we need a lot of things uh, from the idea to a clinical. GLP clinical, uh, preclinical testing, vector production, and uh, 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 the, the most difficult is, is try to make it as, as, as a product. I, I don't, I don't think um, we in Taiwan can do many of those. Uh, so we need uh, to have a, a good connection uh, with uh, the other, the uh, the. the uh, U.S. Uh, um, uh, for example, um, I collaborate with the PTC is, is also in New Jersey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we do need a, a, a very good connection so our uh, idea can uh, come true, can become a real product. But uh, we also hope that uh, because uh, we, we do very um, early part of the job, so uh, uh, so we do hope that uh, through those uh, collaboration, uh, we can have chances to go through the whole process. Uh, so uh, uh, in, in the future, we can have a, a full industry in Taiwan uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hu. Uh, Dr. Wang Yu Tai Wang, do you have any comments? <laughs> uh, uh, actually, uh, I cannot represent uh, Ministry of Science and Te uh, Technology officer to answer uh, your question. However, uh, uh, I can answer about the uh, sustainable platform uh, for uh, big data in health, this project, uh, the, answer, uh, the question. So um, I can say that uh, based the participant side in informed consent content, the foreign companies and organization cannot be uh, cannot be data user directory. However, uh, foreign companies and organizations can collab collaborate with uh, domestic companies and uh, organizations. Then uh, uh, the domain, uh, domestic uh, companies and uh, organizations uh, can apply the data. However, uh, the insurance usage is disproved. Okay. Uh, that's my uh, opinion, uh, opinion. Thank you. Understand. Thank you. And final, Dr. Wang Pingling. Hello. Uh, about the uh, advantage of Taiwan, I'm actually thinking there are two fields that uh, Taiwan is advanced. The first the one is a multi, um, uh, multi omic data homologation. What I mean is that uh, Taiwan, uh, we have a uh, relative uh, complete uh, medical record uh, plus with the uh, data such as uh, MRI or drug response information uh, in the US uh, for those data is actually not that easy to uh, access. So probably in Taiwan, we can homologize uh, those data to build a methodology, translate that methodology to a model 
and then share the model. I don't mean share the data. Of course, sharing data is quite important, but uh, as a data scientist, I'm always thinking if we can change that the data into a model and uh, share the model, that could be one way to uh, accelerate uh, the entire uh, research field. And so uh, that is the uh, first one about the uh, multi-omic data in Taiwan. The second one, I think, the second one I'm thinking is that uh, we always say that Taiwan is very good for chip design. And as you probably know, currently we're still using the software such as BWA, GATK to process our whole genome sequence data. But how about uh, why don't we implement it uh, into, uh, I mean, a chip? on chip, uh, on chip algorithm, then uh, we can uh, process data much faster. And besides that, uh, we can also design a chip for uh, encryption and uh, faster downloading, uh, uploading our data to the cloud, as uh, Dr. Wang just pointed out in the future, uh, all the data will be on the cloud. So that uh, encryption may be uh, also a fit and faster downloading, uploading, also, I think uh, something we need uh, in the future. So I think uh, these two fields probably uh, Taiwan, uh, I will say Taiwan uh, is advanced and uh, I believe uh, Taiwan can lead uh, this uh, discussion uh, in the world. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, next, I will ask some questions from our audience. The first question from our audience is for Dr. Li Sanwang. Uh, as mentioned in your speech, uh, targeting beta amyloid and tau protein in Alzheimer's is kind of too late for the disease to progress. Is there any other mechanisms that can explain the occurrence of AD by pacing the amyloid hypothesis? Well, I think that's a million dollar question that uh, uh, there are a lot of clinical trials for, uh, for amyloids that's not working. There are some trials targeting tau that uh, also, it's a little bit disappointing as well, but uh, like th these two proteins are the most well-known, uh, you know, uh, proteins associated with uh, disease. So it's really hard to find other things at this point. And there are many ed evidence that uh, they are important. So I guess one question is, uh, they are very important, but are they the best targets for therapy developments? So uh, there are other things that's probably not just about the uh the, the the pathological proteins itself but uh, looking at other mechanisms that are modulating or modifying it for example i think the hardest thing that people are looking at is looking at uh, the role of immunity in alzheimer's in neurodegeneration in particular people are starting to look at uh, glial cells these are not neurons but in the brain but seem to play really important roles uh there's a lot of study looking at this so-called microglia that does all kinds of Probably they play important roles in uh, clearing uh, amyloid. So, so that's another possibility to look at it. And, and and then the trick is finding out why, and find out what's the right uh, therapeutic strategies. So, so small molecules might not work, and because it's not about blocking something, it's not about eliminating something. Gene therapy could be very interesting. I, I'm really not an expert on this, but uh, that's my thought. We need more targets especially from genetic findings, that's going to give us new ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Li San Huang. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Wu Lianghu. Uh, it's also a question from our audience that uh, mentioning in the example of gene therapy for AADC deficiency, what roles do NGS tools play in analyzing the genetic information? And in addition to cancer diagnosis, can NGS diagnosis tools be applied to other disease areas? Um, yes, um, I, I think for a DC deficiency itself, um, uh, it's, it's a gene therapy is not really an, an, an sequencing project, um, but um, um, you, you know, it's, it's a very, very rare disorder that no doctor can suspect such a diagnosis uh, for their patient, uh, but then Nowadays, they, they do whole, whole axon sequencing, the whole gene sequencing, then they make a diagnosis. So, so we, we have a, a more unexpected diagnosis of uh, this rare disorders uh, uh, almost all over the world, especially in China, because they, they don't have clinician, but they have a lot of sequencing. Um, 
And and the second question, talking about the next generation sequencing, it's, it's everywhere. I think the first is my disease is genetic disease, the second is cancer. But now you know that uh, for the, the for the COVID nineteen, you you want to know is is our beta data. They, they use NGS, so so NGS is is very powerful. And for the epidemiologists, then they, they use NGS to see uh, all the variant for association. So uh, uh, it's a really powerful tool, and this is kind of a mature. Um, but the next is how to read the data. So we need the bioinformatics. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hu. Um, my next question is, how much would gene therapy cost in Taiwan? Is it possible they covered by our national insur health insurance? I'm not sure whether Dr. Hu or Dr. Guo would be appropriate to uh, answer the question. Maybe uh, Dr. Hu or Dr. Guo. <laughs> um, so, so Taiwan is, is one part of the, the world, so there is no big difference in the cost of medicine. Um, for example, um, um, the, for the, not the first, but the, the biggest the gene therapy, this is for SMA, um, has been approved in Taiwan, uh, even though uh, the insurance company is still discussing the, the price, the, the price with, with the drug company, but it will not be um, far from the price in uh, other countries. Yeah. But I, I also think that, um, so Taiwan is, uh, to my point of view, is a quite developed country. Um, so it should be no problem to support uh, the cost of the gene therapy if it is effective. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I just so, wondering. So, I, I, so I agree. I agree with the, uh, Professor Hu, uh, Wu, because um, it's not how much gene therapy costs, but compared to what? Right. So if you don't have therapy, you have to take care of the patient for long term. You know, a lot of trouble. The family has to spend a lot of time and loss of income and so forth. And the, the person, the patient is not productive. Then it's actually a much higher cost than the gene therapy cost, even if it's the high price tag. So I think you have to look at things in context, not just, you know, one thing in isolation. Thank you, Dr. Guo. I think Dr. Li San Wang maybe can share with us the U.S. experience in gene therapy cost. It must uh, be much higher compared to Taiwan. Oh yeah, it's a lot higher. I, I don't know, I heard number, I, I forgot this, uh, but uh, it could be costing like hundreds of thousands of dollars for, for this kind of treatment. Uh, I think at this moment, it's uh, still focusing on rare diseases uh, where the genetic mechanism is probably clear. Uh, so so uh, uh, it's no surprise it's gonna be expensive. Um, but uh, for some of these diseases, that's probably the only way to uh, treat, yeah. Dr. Uh, Dr. Li, uh, Wan Ping Li, maybe you have some comments as well. Yeah, I think uh, it's quite expensive in uh, the U.S. Uh, people, uh, we joke that uh, the distance, uh, I mean, uh, from you to be a uh, uh, bankrupt, only one medical bill, then uh, you were bankrupt. So I will say Taiwan, yes, it's uh, probably will uh, go, uh, I mean, will go faster than the uh, U.S. to, uh, I mean, to make it happen. Here it's... Uh, I mean, no, it's too expensive, yeah. Thank you. As we all know, U.S. healthcare has a lot of problems, and especially for the health insurance. So Taiwan should be proud of our own national insurance uh, system. My further question is uh, for Dr. Hu. Uh, what's the most challenging of CNS gene therapy? Is CRISPR technology truly better than AAV? Um, so, um, so there, there, there are a lot of challenges in the CNS, uh, treatment. It's for every medicine. Uh, it's not just for gene therapy. Actually, uh, it, it's a, it's a better field. It's a relative, uh, uh, advantage for gene therapy to target the CNS. So, so use vector to target the CNS. It's, uh, sometimes easier to 
design a small molecule that can really act very well uh, in the brain. <laughs> um, but certainly, uh, people uh, try very much um, to uh, target the brain. Um, for example, uh, from the uh, switch uh, from the homology, uh, they kind of uh, develop a new AAB vector that can uh, penetrate the brain uh, in a much better way uh, than the other serotype uh, of the uh, vectors. Um, but, but even before that, um, direct inject um, vector to the brain, to the CSF uh, space especially, it's quite convenient uh, um, for, for gene therapy to across the blood brain barrier. Yeah. So think about uh, if you use a small molecule or enzyme to treat the brain, you need to inject uh, to the uh, uh, lumbar space every two weeks, one month. But for, for gene therapy, uh, uh, no matter how difficult, uh, uh, for example, my surgery will take uh, eight hours, but this is just one sample hole. And uh, so I, I think the, uh, the in, in the future, then the main field uh, for gene therapy is the brain. Yeah. Uh, it, this is also the area that the current medicine uh, for short. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hu. Any our panelists would like to respond or comment? I think no. Okay, so our time is 11.44 right now and our agenda is supposed to start at 11.40, but I have a final question and I would like to ask each panelist as our conclusion question. It's also very general. Um, we talk about genetic uh, analysis and gene therapy today all, almost all the time. So I would like to uh, narrow down my questions to focus on genetics for each panelist. Could you please share some of your practical examples? I know you have shared in your uh, speech, and I would like to learn more about your past experiences in international genetic uh, collaboration. What are the challenges you see because of regulatory, because of privacy law, because of ethic issues? But you also see some opportunities. What are those opportunities? And any lessons you think Taiwan should keep up to, in order to um, catch up with US and European gene therapy development. Maybe I will go first with Dr. Li San Wang. Well, uh, the biggest challenge for uh, internal collaboration with uh, data sharing uh, is uh, really just like different policies across different countries. When, uh, well, uh, you mentioned uh, European, and uh, the biggest challenge is the GDPR, the general privacy, uh, and, and and that makes it really hard for a data to, uh, a, 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 like European data to go to other countries. And, and that creates a tension, that creates a problem, because uh, what you want is to see some kind of fair, equal data exchange. And I'm not saying that European is the only country where data becomes difficult, and uh, there are other countries as well. I think Taiwan is uh, relatively, uh, more open in that sense, and uh, based on my experience, but uh, also I know that uh, there are some internal challenges uh, in Taiwan with respect to uh, privacy, with respect to regulations. I think all of these can be addressed. The most important thing is uh, we, we, we just remember that uh, it's important to uh, make the data available to uh, researchers. Uh, that's really important for uh, scientific advances, and we're all committed to uh, move forward in that direction. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Wang. Uh, how about Dr. Guo? Yeah, so um, I think that uh, one of the biggest things that uh, the government can do is to kind of focus on the vision rather than on the details. <laughs> because uh, if you make the system uh, more open to collaboration and research, uh, that would do a lot. Uh, because um, most people are too worried about they do something that will violate the law or, or regulation and so forth. And, and it's just easier not to try. Uh, but if it's a, a different attitude, a different culture where trying something is welcome and is encouraged, uh, then it's really good. So I think uh, Dr. Lee's uh, uh, suggestion of Kind of exchanging models rather than exchanging data is a really good one and so the same thing you know everybody's busy but if we can 
have someone's uh, idea and be willing to bring them to Taiwan, you know, gene therapy approaches, new ideas, to do it right here, and then just exchange the, the experience and results. I think that would be a, a great way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Guo. Uh, how about Dr. Hu? Um, yes, I, I just think about uh, uh, my own experience. So I, I uh, frequently uh, communicate with my uh, friend colleagues uh, all over the world. But it, it's, it's very difficult to do something uh, officially through the hospitals, through the school, and to connect to uh, the other uh, institute uh, in the US, uh, for example. Yeah. So. Um, for example, uh, this is one institute in the US, they are interested in my mouse model, but I, I say, whoa, I, I never done that. There's, there's no one done that in, in NTU, so it's, uh, it's a very challenging thing. So, um, um, so um, I, I, I think the uh, infrastructure uh, starting from the institute and uh, and also the government and um, uh, talking about the uh, data sharing um, and it's a shame that uh, we, we do use a lot of data from the US uh, so we apply for that uh, but uh, we, we never share uh, any real data from my patient to the other countries because that is almost impossible um, so we have this uh, 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 biobank rules, and that will go know a little bit about this. And it's a, it's a very uh, uh, complicated. Um, so um, I, I, I don't know. So it should be a lot to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hu. And how about Dr. Wang, Yu Taiwan? Uh, yes. Um... I would like to mention two, uh, two kinds of information technology. Probably uh, they will uh, solve this kind of uh, issue in future. Uh, the first one is homomorphic uh, encryption. And the second one is federa uh, federated learning. Uh, because this kind of uh, uh, technology can uh, let, uh, let our data in, uh, uh, in in computer, uh, sorry, uh, processing without a pri uh, privacy issue. Mm. For example, uh, uh, homomorph homomorphic encryption technology is is uh, is kind of uh, sorry, uh, the data in uh, encrypted form, encrypted inf uh, statement, and uh, into the com computation. Uh, so right now, uh, the scientists. Uh, still developing a kind of uh, um, uh, algorithm so the data can be processing in uh, encrypted form. Okay, uh, how, the, the second one is uh, a federated learning. Uh, just like uh, uh, Dr. Lee mentioned, uh, we can exchange the model without exchanging the data. So federated, federated learning is kind it, it, uh, is such kind of uh, idea. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang. And final, Dr. Li. Okay, yeah, I think uh, I will say the challenge, I think maybe a bit uh, low end compared to other panelists. I can tell you uh, what every day I worry about. Now I am processing uh, Data one just say 17k whole genome sequence data. I have 200, uh, 250 million sniff variation on my hand, and some uh, most of them don't associate with Alzheimer's, of course. Even I narrow down to gene or uh, coding region, they still don't relate it to some disease. What can I do? I think I. I really don't know. I, yeah, I would say I really don't know what are they, uh, why we have those uh, variations, are they important, what are their uh, function? I I don't have knowledge at them all, but data is there, variation is there. We are human, we have those variations, what can we do? I don't know. So I would say at least uh, our government can do is that can we have some more uh, exchanging program? We have some uh, student, uh, I mean, uh, let them uh, study abroad, then uh, we can exchange uh, our uh, student in the US to the Taiwan. So at least uh, I think uh, we can have that uh, exchanging 
program, then uh, we can uh, change more uh, by informatician. Then uh, in the future, we can uh, uh, co-work on those data. Then uh, we can conquer or cure uh, disease in the future. But I would say probably not now. Yeah, I mean, cure disease probably not now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liz. It seems like we all have much of work to do. And uh, I know we are running out of time, but I see one more last question from our uh, chair box. So maybe let me ask this final question and then we will conclude today's uh, wonderful program. Um, so the question is, with, um, Taiwan has a relative smaller population comparing to United States or even China. Would it be more difficult to conduct clinical trial locally for gene therapy since there won't be many, uh, many patients available? Maybe I think Dr. Hu can answer this question since you have clinical experiences. Um. <laughs> Actually, I don't think um, um, this is the problem. So we have so many diseases. Um, uh, it's, it's the number is it's, it's thousands of diseases. So uh, I, I think um, everyone, um, every country, large or small, you can find your own niche and to develop. Uh, the, 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 the benefit of gene therapy is it's a, it's a kind of universal tool. Uh, so you have, uh, I always say that you have the cargo uh, you, you just uh, determine what you want to load and one way to go. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I see uh, in Taiwan, in many uh, uh, countries uh, for new researchers, uh, but uh, we need to connect the chain, the production chain, the development chain together. Uh, otherwise, we go nowhere. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hu. Uh, maybe Dr. Guo, do you have any final comments? No, I mean, uh, when people think of Taiwan as being small, but Taiwan is like more than half the size of California. Think of how much stuff California has done. So uh, I wouldn't worry about the size. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the uh, panelists and all our audience to take the time for two and a half, more than two and a half hours uh, joining today's meeting. I hope our discussion will lay a good foundation for collaboration between Taiwan and the United States. And I look forward to seeing concrete results in the near future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And have a good evening and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.